And welcome to another edition of South Texas Crossfire. This is attorney Joe Flores reminding you to join us each and every week right here on KTMV with the Lopez family. Special thanks to my former client, Don Humberto Lozano Lopez. He passed away in 2011, but he's honored, he's venerated, and he's never forgotten. And my good friend, Carlos Lopez, you guessed it, the Ted Turner of South Texas Broadcasting. Uh, he allows me to have this show on, and uh, we're making history here. We bring on some of the best, the brightest here in our South Texas community, from artists to leaders to power brokers to people that make things to happen, change. And we're going to be with a guest here today to talk about things that are going on, not just behind the scenes, but right there in front of you, how you can get involved. And that's not uh, anything that uh, uh, is, is hard to do. It's just to register, vote, get involved. And so with all that, I bring on a great man by the name of Hugo Berlanga. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me. Thank you. Uh, you. You've been on since the very beginning, a uh, decade ago, and you believed in us and you've come on. We've been by uh, and interviewed you in Austin. Uh, you maintain a, a very busy practice, and we'll talk about what you do then. But I think a lot of people hear Berlanga, Berlanga, Berlanga. You know, you've <laughs> even been a coach, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, was it uh, soccer? No, basketball, basketball? And, uh, basketball and baseball. Baseball, basketball and baseball. And, and your arch enemy, Mr. Germany, my neighbor, you know, and you, he said you were a competitor, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, old Germany, he's still around. So I just wanted to say hi to him. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, what, Great what catch. Makes, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, <laughs> make, what makes you tick? I mean, where did you grow up? And, and t oh. tell me a little bit about your family. Uh, well, I mean, people don't know yeah. a lot about your background. Well, I mean, I was, you know, I, I mean, I was born in Robstown. Uh, my father was, was from Robstown. My mother was from Banquete, raised, uh, uh, born and raised in Banquete. And then obviously she, she, she met my dad. And they had, there were seven siblings. And uh, I was the first out of the seven to, uh, to go to college. And I attended schools there in Robstown. I mean, I went to St. Anthony's Catholic School. My upbringing was basically in, in that environment initially before I transferred over to public schools. And then when we came to Corpus, I will, you know, we lived on, uh, on Pueblo Street. <laughs> and we would bus to come downtown to Corpus Christi Cathedral, and that was that's where that's where we kind of grew up. And then eventually, you know, we went into the public schools. Austin started at Austin, and then later on, when we moved, I went to Lexington, and then South Park, and then Carroll High School during, during that whole span. And then I went to Del Mar College and uh, got an associate's degree. And then I bused myself to Kingsville at that time, Texas A and I Kingsville, and got a degree. Uh, came out of that environment and went uh, uh, thinking that I was going to, well I did, I started out teaching and working with juvenile delinquents at Martin Old Juvenile Hall. Giving them, when, so when they were incarcerated, we were giving them instructions so they wouldn't fall completely behind with their schoolwork sure. until their, their cases got, the, the, the disposition of them got taken care of. And at the same time, the school district got credit because those kids were counted as part of their average daily attendance. So after a short stint from there, then I got into banking. I got the opportunity to go work for New Oasis National Bank. How in the world did you go from <laughs> taking care of those kids to banking? Well, I mean, I think part of it was, I mean, I've always been a very outgoing person. And, uh, and you know, it's public relations yes. and, and all that. Because after that, I mean, I, I go into banking and, and I started out, you know, helping them uh, with delinquent accounts, reaching out to people to try to get them to restructure their debt so on and so forth. And eventually I started working my way up and then I went to, uh, I went to banking school one summer at SMU. They have a great banking uh, program there. And uh, SMU made a great impression on me. So much so <laughs> that I wanted my son to go there. And, uh, and he did. He went to SMU and he graduated from SMU and it's a great, great. school. And uh, gave, him a gave him a great foundation. And of course now he works for me, but at the end of the day, uh, I think it's been that my personality, I think, has uh, driven me because after I went from banking, uh, of course, I went into the legislature uh, during, that, during that time at New Oasis, and then I went to work for Coca-Cola, American Bottling Company and the Dunham family and the Snyder family, and, and I did that for, gosh, 15, 18 years. Uh, and then, you know, then I evolved and started doing set up a consulting firm and started doing some consulting work and by that time I'm you know I'm getting out of the legislature and 
So I started, uh, I had no intention, to be honest with you, that I was going to do that. Uh, I stepped back, at, in my opinion, at the top of my game. I had already been on the Texas Monthly's 10 best list, three consecutive sessions, which is unheard of for a, for a Hispanic. And then, uh, and of course here, not too long ago, years, maybe seven or eight years ago, they even inducted me into the Texas Monthly 10 best Hall of Fame, which is, I mean, uh, that's, I a, read that's about a great, that. that's a, that's that was a, that's a great a honor. And, and so, you know, for our community, but, you know, so when, so I stepped out and I, and I had a call from, I'll never forget this, I had a call from Alan Wilson, who at the time was the president of the Driscoll Children's um, Foundation, called me in and wanted to talk to me that they had some issues and would I be interested in, in representing them. And, and so, and having to come out of the healthcare environment, uh, it was easy for me and I understood what their issue was. So <coughs> I, I decided to represent them well. The minute word got out that I was going to start lobbying, then I mean, all of a sudden I had a bunch of different people calling me wanting to know whether I would represent them or not. And, uh, and I've been doing it now for going on 20 years, and, and I enjoy it. Uh, I just turned 70, and I get asked all the time, how long are you going to keep doing this? I say, you know what, as long as it's still fun, and every issue, every, every client is different. Can I advise so, you as a lawyer to say, I'll so it's do challenging. it in, uh, in 30 years. When I look 70, <laughs> I'll stop. Right? I mean, we look the same age. Yeah. I'm 50. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, I've always teased you. You know, you take good care of yourself. And, you know, uh, uh, but it's hard to, the age that you were up there, you were yeah. a young guy. This yeah. is the 70s. I, was, I mean, yeah. you were a young fellow. I was 26 years old when I got elected. I was honored to be and, uh, and I kid around you know, all the time. I tell her, you know, they get a big laugh. I tell them, I said, they said, wait a second. Even when George Bush was going, he asked me, they said, you've been around here almost 20 years? He said, when did you get here? And I said, I was 12 when I got elected. And he laughed. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, I've been blessed in so many ways. Absolutely. And uh, I have a very strong support system around me. I have a great circle of friends. And I enjoy what I'm doing. And as long as I'm enjoying it, I mean, I cannot see myself sitting around uh, watching novellas and all that. I mean, I stay tuned. I come in late at night. And I'll, I'll tune in to CNN. I may flip over to Fox to see what they're saying. And just to get a feel for what's, what's going on nationally, of course, my phone is, is my lifeline, and, and I get every breaking news article or anything that's, that's happening in the world. And uh, but I feel uh, bad about calling you at midnight. I said, he's, <laughs> he's up. He's just finishing his day right now. I mean, yeah, you work hard. it's true. I come. I mean, I come home and I've got a stack of emails and stuff that I got to flip through and look at it. Yeah. And, and so you know, again, uh, it, it's what keeps me going, and I enjoy it. And uh, and it's been a great run, and I hope it lasts. I hope it lasts another thirty years. I have a good friend who just turned ninety six. Ninety six, extremely active, former marine was a pilot trainer in here at NSA, got held back during the war and said, no, you're not leaving, you're gonna start training others. And he is now in third generation, industrial fabricators. He gave the company to his son. His son now is giving it to his son. And they've got another 12 year old, Cody, who's coming up, uh, a Chase, I'm sorry, that's coming up and he'll probably be the next. There's not too many companies in corpus that can say that they have passed the torch already three times and this gentleman is 96, he is still active, still drives, he does the Saxon gun shows, he's one of my clients, Corpus, the Valley, and in San Antonio. Wow. And still driving, and, his, and he got asked by, by one of your competitive stations, Channel 3, uh, what was, you know, what did he attribute his, his longevity and whatnot, and he said, good tequila. And I drink tequila with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that you know, that, that in moderation. Good. But I mean, of but course, it, <laughs> of course. But uh, but yeah. just uh, but it goes to it, it goes without saying that I mean, you know, it's all it's all about opportunity. Sometimes I'd say I'd rather be lucky than smart. And uh, and and I just love the challenge. I love the legislative challenge. And uh, I was good at it on the inside. And I think I've been pretty successful from the outside. Well, the defining, some of the defining moments, when you were uh, in the legislature and, and you got in at 26, um, you know, of course, you're not the type of guy who has a chip on his shoulder, I'm Hispanic, nothing can be yeah. done because, yeah. you, no, you, you, you didn't accept that. No. That's obvious. No. When you got in there, you said, you know, I don't care if I'm brown, green, whatever. 
uh, we're going to make things happen. So the defining moment, when did you know when you were serving there that you had said, I am making inertia, that change. Mm -hmm. I am, this is the 70s, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it, it took a while in South yeah. Texas. Right. You, through on, also mm -hmm. was a, yeah. a, a, a very, very big uh, fundamental kind of, and Salamon, mm -hmm. all of you guys. Right. We stand on the shoulders of you guys. But what was one of the defining moments there when you're in Austin and you sit there and you come outside the Capitol and go, you know what, I'm making a difference here? Yeah. I, I think, I mean, from the get go, and I'll never forget this. Uh, Epi Gonzalez, who's a very <laughs> dear friend and has been for so many years, he was the HR uh, manager for Coastal States. And he was very active in my campaign. And he remembered, he tells me, he said, by the way, when you go to Austin, please try to go outside, what we would say now, outside the box. Don't allow yourself to be regulated to go to to healthcare, I mean, human services or welfare programs or this or that. He said, you need to go to the tax writing committee. You need to go to natural resources. You need to go to energy. Things that, and, 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 and he was right, because at the end of the day, tax policy, and I was on the committee for 18 years, tax policy affects all of us, all of us. Insurance policy affects all of us. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're brown, blue, yellow, it doesn't make any difference. We're all affected. And then the other, the other piece of advice was Tony Canales to tell me, because at the time I was, my, my entire time when I got out of college was that I wanted to be mayor of Corpus Christi. And I had an opportunity to run with Luther Jones on his city council slate, and I got pulled back and I said, hey, look, if you really want to make a difference, it's in Austin. That's where it really makes a lot of difference. And so I did that. So I go to the Ways and Means Committee my first term, and I'm on natural resources. And why is that important? Because of our water, everything that we have around here. Tax policy, and so that's where I kind of made my little niche, and then all of a sudden, the powers to be said, and, and I was the only, I, I believe I was the only Hispanic on the committee. And they're all saying, you know what? <laughs> this kid gets it. He understands it. And you know, there were some challenging times on some tax policy and whatnot. I was there when we passed the only tax bill we've, had, we've passed in the last 40 years. And it was signed, and it was signed by a Republican governor. And, so, and we haven't had one since. And that's why I think we've fallen behind in certain areas. But having said that, all of a sudden people kind of started noticing. And there was an education process. I befriended some people, uh, one of which was a gentleman by the name, he's deceased now, by the name of Olin Brewer, who was a speechwriter for John Conley. And the very first time I met him at a freshman orientation. He walks up to me and introduces himself. And the minute I heard his name, I said, uh, I said, Mr. Brewer, I said, you were John Conley's speechwriter. And he was just kind of like floored. He didn't expect this little freshman coming in to know enough about Texas history or having read any books enough to all of a sudden that he's depicted in the book and here he is in front of me. We became very good friends and we educated each other because unfortunately, the powers to be would always regulate the minority members, whether you were African American or Hispanic, always got kind of rele relegated to certain committees. Okay. And, and so, That's true. And so I started really working hard. And of course, when I got into the position of uh, Speaker Pro Tem and was on the inside where we were making committee assignments, and I started pushing the caucus members to various committees, higher education, chairmen of, in chairman of insurance, so on and so forth. And we started really going outside the box. And, uh, and, and, and I think that was a big breakthrough. And, and, and I would sit there and, and tell uh, uh, Olin, and we would talk, and I told, and Olin would tell me, he said, you know what, I want to learn more about your community, and I, wanna, and I want to work with you, and we need to see how we can make. Because I told the story the other night. I came back home after my first legislative term, and I started meeting with the different groups from here the medical community, the realtors, and all these groups, sit down and have lunch post-session. And they tell me, uh, just wanted to visit with you, talk to you about what took place in Austin. Wanted you, uh, you had a perfect record. Man, I get, I said, man, that's great. He said, yeah, you voted against us every time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going, I said, I said, I did? And I said, well, I said, well, let me ask you something. Who represents y'all? Who's your lobbyist? Well, it's so-and-so. And I said, well, let me just tell you, if he walked in this room right now to have lunch with I wouldn't even know who he is. There you go. 
And so that was the beginning when I started realizing that we had to be trained. And so I started telling everybody, look, I've said this to governors. When George Bush came in and we sat in and we talked, I told him, I appreciate you bringing me in to talk to me because I'm one of the guys that have been here the longest and they've told you all this stuff about me. I said, but understand one thing. At the end of the day, I don't care if I'm a chairman or I'm just a member, we still just have one vote. One vote. Doesn't make any difference. If, you don't, if you're not a chairman of committee or vice chairman of committee, it doesn't matter. At the end of the name, it's, it's a numbers game. 76 votes to pass a bill. That's it. That's it. So, and I told, and this was the advice that I gave to the president, I mean to the governor at that time. Do not underestimate and get out of your ivory tower and start meeting all the members, not just the chairman. Because when push comes to shove, you need 76. You need and, all the votes. And, and, and he took that advice, and he took Austin by storm, having been an outsider. And, uh, and, and, and the, other, the other piece of advice I gave him, because he told me, he said, we're going to spend a lot of time together when I told him, hey, you're the fifth governor I've, that I've been with. I've had two, two lieutenant governors and three speakers. And I said, I can tell you all the in and out. I can tell you every governor's weakness and strength. And he said, we're going to spend a lot of time together. And, and we forged an incredible relationship. In fact, I just got a letter from him because I had sent him a little uh, gift card for his birthday. On He turned 72. And in typical fashion, he says, you know, it's kind of hard to, to think that I've turned 72. He said, but I feel like 27. <laughs> you know? And so we share this, this incredible relationship um, on a personal basis. But... But it went without saying that he, he, he got it. And the other thing, advice I told him, I said, look, we can disagree, the lieutenant governor, the governor, us, when we get in, in meetings, but don't ever let that spill out. Don't ever challenge the Senate or the House. Remember, we have a separation of powers. You're the executive branch. We're the legislative branch. Now, we'll listen to you. We may agree with you, but we will never, we shouldn't criticize you. Right. And you shouldn't criticize us. You may not always get your way, and we may not always get our way. I said, but that's the art of compromise and, and, and making the legislative process work. And he took that to heart, and, and he was, to me, uh, one of my favorite governors to work with, and, and he was so good at what he did, and, uh, and he's a real people's person. And, uh, and we had some other great governors. I mean, I mean, even the rough, gruff Bill Clements I liked. I mean, we, because we had a very... His personality was straight up, and he told it like it was, and we didn't miss words and whatnot, but we had a great relationship, and, and I traveled with him to Mexico and other things. But, you know, and again, and Mark White was good, you know, and it did certain things, did some things I didn't agree, but, but they all had that. But, but by and large, when I look at all the sitting governors that I worked with, Bush was my favorite. Uh you know, you mentioned the speechwriter, you know, that, that he had, you know, a, a certain indelible mark uh, mm -hmm. that, that he left with you. Now, how did it come about, uh, you know, besides you, you really standing out and, and working hard, uh, getting that spot, that pro temp spot that allowed other Hispanics to open those doorways and, mm -hmm. and take the philosophy, the Berlanga philosophy, if you will, of don't just serve on what Hispanics should serve on, right. but you gave them the opportunity. Yeah. Then you, in turn, got other people to mm -hmm. do the same, okay? Yeah. So yeah. it spread and it gave Hispanics more power than they had ever had mm -hmm. in the legislature. And, and, and who really pushed for you for, for pro tem? Well, it was a speaker who made that decision, uh, Gib Lewis. And, and I asked him, <clears throat> and, 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 we, and we still office together. We have this incredible relationship and have for years. And so we office together there in Austin, on, uh, right there close to the Capitol. And one night we were out having dinner and one night, I, and I finally, you know, it, I had not had the discussion with him. And I brought it up and I said, by the way, I said, whose idea was it for me to be Speaker Pro Tem, number one, and to have my office in the back hallway from the deliberative body on the second floor. Perfect. Speaker's office was on the left and at the end of the hallway was my office. It has never been done that way. The Speaker Pro Tem never got that much authority, never got that much to be part of the, the, the making of everything that was going on, and, uh, and it's never happened again. The unfortunate thing that has transpired is that, of course, we've had uh, African Americans, we've had women Speaker Pro Tems, and, and the late Matt Garcia, who introduced me when we had the ceremony, when I got it uh, put in that position, 
you know, stated it, that hopefully I would not be the last, that I was the first, but hopefully not the last. Well, right. unfortunately, there has not been another one. And hopefully at some time there's a, but, but Speaker Lewis was the only one that was willing to share that responsibility of running the house. And he told me, he said, Ooh, well, the, the reason that, that I chose you is because of your personality and everybody liked the way you worked and everything else. And I figured that if anybody could bridge everybody and keep everybody and be my eyes and ears on the floor. And he said, because I knew this is an awesome responsibility to, to herd in 150 members and then deal with the Senate and deal with the governor and the lieutenant governor and all those, all those things. And uh, he said, that's why I picked you. And he said, and, and, and it goes without saying, you did an incredible job for me. It almost and, uh, reminds me of like the whip sort of, uh, like a majority you know, whip in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Congress. Oh yeah, well I, I mean, and, and, and you have to get those votes in line. And one know? of the things that we did that, that, I, that I admired Gibb for doing, because he come obviously came, came out of the, the business sector and was still in business, still is. In fact, he just sold his business. He came in and we completely changed the culture at the Capitol. He came in and said, you know, we, we brought some uniformity to the, to the system. To begin with, he said, we're going to put all of the sergeants in navy blue blazers, gray slacks, with, a, with a maroon ties. And the ladies will wear blazers, and they will also wear gray either pants or skirts, and they'll have the state seal on their deal so we know. Because it used to be we would hire a sergeant of arms, and they dressed like they were college students and whatnot. Sometimes you couldn't even tell if they were a member, you know, with the new freshman class coming in, or if they were a... A sergeant. So we brought discipline and decor, real big decor. When Billy Clayton was there, it was like on Fridays, everybody wore jeans. You, but you always have to wear a necktie and whatnot. And people kind of abused it. They'd use polo ties and this and that. <laughs> and Gibb was a stickler. Gibb yeah. is very impeccable about his dress and demeanor and everything else. And, uh, and I'll never forget, I hadn't even been there. We hadn't even been there a week. I mean, I was speaker pro tem, and I got be bopping out there. <laughs> In, in jeans and all that, and then he pushed my button. I walk up to the podium, and he said, "We will never, ever wear jeans on this floor." And he said, "Please do not do that." He said, "We're going to set a new standard, and I don't need my speaker pro tip running around in jeans." Oh, and wow. so it was all. So we did that. We made a lot of changes, where it really impacted the the minority community. In my opinion, was that <coughs> here before. Of course, every committee gets half of the committee is made by seniority, and the other half, the speaker makes the appointments. On appropriations, obviously, seniority gets, you know, the, the top people that have been there longest always served on, on appropriations. Gibbs said, no, I'm going to change it. I want continuity in the process. Each standing committee will now have a CBO, Chairman of, of Budget and Oversight, and they will defend and deal with that budget of that agency to the full committee. Number two, he said, I want the best and the brightest that I can find out there, not based on seniority, for appropriations only. And it worked beautifully. To, to reach out and to get the best and the brightest to come not based on seniority. Obviously, we had a lot of grumbling because some of the senior members got bumped out of there. You know, yeah. and they had been there a long time. So we ruffled some feathers, but you know what, at the end of the day, we calmed everything down and when we did certain things and whatnot. And, and of course, as a result of me being Speaker Pro Tem, I was on calendars committee and I served there until I became chairman of it under, under Gibb for 18 years. And then, and then I'm sitting there on the calendars because obviously the speaker sets it, or would work to set the agenda. I was on the tax writing committee, you know, to, to if we were going to spend very it. Very important. And then, and then I was also on the Legislative Budget Board that prepared the budget to give to the legislature when they started. And so I was on every key deal to be with him in every discussion of any major policy that this state was working on. And, and we would- and, and for 18 years. Well, Speaker Pro Tem for eight. And, uh, but during that whole time, I was, I was pretty much on the inside, but I was really on the inside when Gibb was Speaker because every week we would have breakfast in the Speaker's apartment with the Lieutenant Governor, and the oh, governor yeah. and the chairman of the big committees would always come in and talk policy about what we were doing and where we were headed. And, uh, but I think we did an incredible job. We had, great, we had great chief of staffs that worked for us, Mike Millsap, Doc Arnold, Buddy Jones. Uh, they all went to bigger and better things and, as well. And, 
But we ran a very tight ship and we ran it disciplined. It was very disciplined in what we did. It was very methodical. Gibb did not like having, you know, long-winded debates on issues. He wanted things worked out before they came to the floor. And that was our, that was our MO. And whereas with Speaker Clayton, as long as he had 76 votes, he didn't care whether they were on his team or against him or whatever. 76 votes and let's drive and all that. And that, and that just didn't, didn't bode well with a lot of members. And, and, uh, and then with, and then, uh, so Gibb did a beautiful job for 10 years. And then Pete Laney came in and, and, and Pete, you know, made some changes. Uh, but he also, you know, he liked, he liked things worked, in, worked out as much as possible. We would have some, some debates on the deal, but we kept it to a minimum. With Gibb, mm -mm. everything came, and I, it, appropriations and whatnot, which usually would take, still does today, three days, four days to do it, you know, 600 amendments, everybody taking shots at it, not under Gibb. I mean, we kept it under control, we'd bring it out, boom, 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 get it to conference committee, and that's where all the real work happens. Uh, but he didn't like, I mean, Gibb did not like cutting up members for no reason, for political gain. He, he did not like that. He wanted to deal with issues based on their merits and the policy of what was good for Texas. Uh, you had wanted to talk about uh, the port because that's one of your, your, your biggest clients, mm -hmm. uh, along with Christus, along with all these people that create all these jobs. Uh, uh, what would you say are the most pressing things that we need to be, as Corpus Christians, thinking about right now in South Texans? Well, I mean, there's no question. This is exciting times for the coastal bend. We have $50 billion of capital investment coming into the coastal bend. For example, you look at Exxon. Exxon is talking about employing 600 people with an average salary of $90,000. That's huge for the economy. I think we're going to see some growth down here that, like we've never seen before. And so we have some challenges ahead of us. But for the most part, I think that we got to continue, and obviously the port is the driving engine for our for our economic growth, uh, evident by what's going on over there in San Patricio County and, and, and the things that are going along with the port and what the port is trying to envision and trying to move forward to. Uh, we went. We are now the the leading exporter of of oil in the country, right here. Nobody knows that. Well, the, I, but beyond yeah. the people that are in the know, yeah. nobody yeah. knows and that now we're it, the leading exporter. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that Sean Strawbridge will come here and because he's got a t story to tell. But everything that's going on, you know, we had the Eagleford, which was great for us, and it kind of played down a little bit. But then all of a sudden, we had the Permian Basin. Now they've got a bottleneck. We got pipelines racing to come to the Port of Corpus Christi and beyond to to ensure that that they that that, that product gets moved. We become more independent of foreign oil. That, that, that's a given. But it's exciting times. Our health care system, I think, is exciting with what's going on with the, the renovation, the capital investment that Christus is doing, a $65 million uh, investment to this, the trauma center being over there. They're going to be expanding what their programs are doing. I mean, they, they'd, they'd love nothing better to also have, besides, besides having the leading, in my opinion, cardiology program anywhere with the Dr. Tavares and the Dr. Paul Heath and all the doctors here. I will put those cardiologists against any cardiologist anywhere in the country. That's true. They're that good. But they need to expand and start looking about how to, how to deal with, with stroke victims instead of having to move them to San Antonio or to Houston. And so there's a lot of things that are, there's a lot of moving parts. And I think it's better, I mean, it'll be better for the community in the long run. We have the Dr. Hector P. Garcia family clinic now that is just unbelievable, the service and the number of people that are using that. And it's all one-stop shop with the pharmacy there. You come in, if they need to do x-rays, they can do it. If they need to do blood work, they can do it. Everything is seamless. And it's just been a great asset. I know there was a lot of pushback about what was going on and whatnot, but when you have an old infrastructure, maintenance and operation will, will hit your bottom line hard. And I think it was, at the end of the day, we'll see how it all pans out. But I think at the end of the day, it's good for the, for the, for the medical community. I think what's going on at Christus and, and everything else in the community. And the, but we've got, and what's going on with the university, we've got to have an environment that when doctors come down here to do residency, they want to stay here. We have so much to offer. I mean, if you really stop and think about it. 
But we've got to have the equipment and, and the technology in those hospitals which that they used to get trained with. We need to be sure that those are there for them as well. Otherwise, they're going to go to where the equipment, the best and the, and the, the, the fastest technology is available, you know, which is what they're accustomed to. They don't want to come down to go start their practice and they've got antiquated equipment that's 30 and 40 years old. It doesn't work that way. And, and, and things are revolving so quickly. So I think there's exciting times uh, with, with what's going on, especially with our university, with, with our healthcare system, and the economic development that, that uh, is, is, is really fixing a boom. Um, you know, people sometimes have a, you know, think as lobbyists as being, you know, nothing but, I mean, they're this or that. They have a just, you know, and, and, and I'll be the first one to tell you, there's no question that there's an enormous amount of money that is that goes into political races from the lobby and everything else sure but the greatest the greatest threat is when the supreme court ruled and you have all this other outside outside money coming into the local races and an influence in those races the outcome of those races and you know they're on a different agenda but they've got money to burn and when they come in and dump money into congressional races and things like that. It, it's very disheartening. And, and are and, you and referring to the super PACs like the super uh, Crossroads PACs, of America? All of that. The Koch brothers. All of that. I mean, it, it's out of control. I mean, it is totally out of control. I remember now, Obama almost, mm -hmm. uh, well, she did admonishing the well, Supreme I mean, you got, Court saying, way to go. Uh, <laughs> you've given them mm -hmm. now... Uh, the yeah. little guy mm -hmm. is going to be crushed. He, yeah. His lobbyist that he goes to talk to yeah. is going to have yeah. to compete with Crossroads of America. I mean, we're sitting there. Look at look at look what Beto O'Rourke has done. No PAC money, zero, and he has outraised an incumbent senator. Outraised him because he's guy's out, an animal. Because I mean, he's, he's worked out it. there. He is he has worked it hard and whatnot. I mean, he drew 600 people, 700 people at the Valencia at, for a town hall meeting. He had a fundraiser that, that I was involved in. We had about 140 people that stepped up. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I've never seen such a huge cross-section of this community show up to hear him and to, to be part of his team. And I mean, it's incredible. It's going to be a very tight race. I interviewed him, I mean, and, he's, and, and he's dynamic. He's oh. got a great heart. Mm -hmm. He told me the story of a woman... Mm -hmm. in love with a man and they were separated by the border so right there you have that circle sort of mm -hmm. mexico and united states they had to mm -hmm. get married right there yeah. just like that yeah. and he was right there as a witness he told yeah. me about that and he yeah. said you know we got to build more bridges yeah and than, that and you know than than, than than all these barriers yeah and, and they're our number one trading partner oh yeah no kidding but you know but going back to the lobbying deal look in my position at least i i have the luxury in my opinion it's just like lawyers you can decide whether you want to accept a case or not when people come to me and want to want me to lobby I'm, i've been fortunate enough that i've had some great lobbyist groups that have come to me that want representation at&t i'm doing some work for at&t the dallas cowboys dow chemical uh pharmaceutical i've i've represented the dentists i've represented doctors I've represented, you know, hospitals. I rep, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I, I wind farms. I've been, I've, I've represented uranium companies. I mean, I look at them and I decide, do I, if, if I'm in the legislature, could I be an advocate for this client on what they want to do? Absolutely. And if the answer is no, I'm not gonna do it. Because you got to get behind them. Because at the end of the day, there's other people that that they can go hire. They want to do First Amendment deal. They want to do the the nightclubs and, 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 and the strip joints and this and that, you know what? Somebody else can do it. It doesn't mean it's gotta be me. So I'm very selective in what, I, in, in, in what I do. But at the end of the day, every major organization, so that sometimes it's kind of funny because some of the same people that are complaining, they wanna be sure that, that their doctor, you know, is, is able, that you're able to have access to the doctor or not. The medical community has a huge lobbying effort in Austin. I've been part of it. Every major organization, I don't care if you're doctors, if you're lawyers, if you're contractors, CPAs, uh, dentists, you know, all the sub subsidiaries of that, hospitals, they all have representation in Austin because they want to be sure that they can still continue to do business in an environment that is healthy and productive 
for the services they provide. And sometimes we get lost in the weeds about, well, you know, lobbyists, too much influence from lobbyists. But you know what? Every major group, everybody that works for somebody, I promise you they've got, they've got some representation through an associate. Cities, counties, they all got lobbying arms working in Austin. Well, I mean, look what you're doing with San Juan. Yeah. Down in, down in the valley. I mean, look, they, they, yeah. they're not exactly paying you millions, yeah. but they pay you what they can. Yeah. But you're going down there and you're putting your shoulder to the wheel. Mm -hmm. What's going on with them down there? You yeah. know, because a mm -hmm. lot of people are interested for religious reasons and right. other reasons right. when they go down there. Why, why would San Juan call you? Yeah, well, I mean, they had some issues dealing with infrastructure, dealing with water and trying to get, they, you know, they were in noncompliance with the TCEQ. You know, and similar to what we faced here Which in Corpus. Which is worse than EPA. Yeah, I mean, we face the same dilemma here in trying to navigate them and trying to get them uh, grant money, yeah. low interest money for them to, to, I mean, look, the valley is booming. You get on eight, Business 83, it is seamless from one end to the other. That's before right. before you would drive and you would see nothing but cotton fields, cotton fields, and then you would see the next city. It is now seamless. And, uh, and, and so, I mean, I, like I said, I mean, I've represented the city of Austin before. I've represented Port Aransas before. Uh, I may be hopefully representing uh, Port Aransas in the future. But, I mean, I, I, mean, I get people to, that ask me one, and, 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 and again, I mean, I, I enjoy it. But I think that sometimes people see what happens with the super PACs and the influence of that money, and it gets commingled with lobbying money and mm -hmm. stuff like that, yeah. and it skews the equation a little bit. But I, but I can assure the people that are listening, there is every major organization from the toll truck drivers for the trucking company i mean cons like i said construction the people that work for 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 uh, any construction company whether you're a roofer electrician or whatnot the building trades organized labor they all got representation you know it's just the nature of the animal if you want to stay in business the nurse, and, and, the and, nurse and practitioners uh, that's that, another that are helping doctors 20 I'm years ago, they'd say no, lawsuits. I, I represented you know, the nurse practitioners. Exactly. And, and nurse uh, practitioners, and let me tell you, and we thank you for yeah. that because yeah. we've got a lady, Aaron, that's working with us mm -hmm. right now. And 20 years ago, but now look what it's doing. The doctor does not have time to go out mm -hmm. into the boonies and yeah. see one patient when he's got to see yeah. four an hour in the clinic. Yeah. And now you have those arms and legs and collaboration sure. because of lobbyists being able right. to make that happen. Excellent. Well, it's been a okay. great time. Hugo Berlanga, uh, he has been in service uh, since he was, oh, well, so, I mean, <laughs> starting out before well, he was in Austin. Yeah. But uh, now, in his 70th year, and proud of it, uh, he's still <laughs> working hard. Uh, and if people want to get a hold of you or say they've got a group or They've got a business and they want you to represent them and to get it real power and, and to be able to get in there and talk with the, with the legislators. What is the best way to get a hold of you? I carry my cell phone. That's like I said, that's my love line. I mean, uh, lifeline and, and I operate under Berlanga Business Consultants. The number's real easy to remember. 361-813-9212. 813 Yeah. And, and uh, so from, from education to uh, health care to telemedicine to home care people that. that are frustrated if they want to, mm -hmm. and if they have a certain uh, a group that's taking care of them and they're not happy with them and there's another subset of groups saying, no, no, we want, yeah. we want our very own. How does that work? Yeah. You know, you at, know? You know and, and, and at the end of the day, Joe, I mean, I, I'm the kind of individual that if I don't have the answer, I know where to go find the answer for those individuals right, that need help. And I get a lot of those calls that people just want to know this or that. I mean, I don't charge people for that. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's like free consultants or whatnot. But I mean, I do get a lot of calls from, from individuals. And, and sometimes, you know, they just, they just want to he somebody to hear them. The other thing is, like I said, if I, don't know, I, if I don't know the answer, I know where to go find the answer. I can point you in the right direction. And that's what we have, 813-92-12. And that's Hugo Berlanga, and uh, he is uh, one of the most influential people that we've had. I know he's got to run. He's got some important lunches and things to take care of. Yeah. And uh, South Texas never sleeps, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And uh, we've heard some good news, so hang in there. Stay here living here with us, and uh, stay here tuned with us. This is Joe Flores signing off. Thank you all, and God bless.